So um, this is the end of the, um, I mean, this is sort of how normally we hear it, right? With uh, the equivalent happening at the uh, quarter note level, right? Um, so... <laughs> note equivalents and if we were to play it with uh, the equivalence uh, in the measure it would be something more like this <laughs> um, so a, a sense of acceleration what's your reading of that Erica well, I hear that very much the same as the equivalent passage in the Eroica Symphony, which is all in the skirts of the Eroica, where um, you're in da 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 da, and then it goes da 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 da, da you know, so you're squishing into the alla breve just for a few bars, mm -hmm. and uh, it happens, uh, it happens a few times in in. Um, I mean, it also happens at the end of the scherzo of the Ninth Symphony, just before you go into the trio section. Bum ba da bum, bum ba da bum, bum 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 bum. bum. Mm -hmm. I feel like the same thing is happening here. Um, and the, I, I strongly feel that the bar, if you maintain the bar as, as the listesso tempo, then what you retain is the dance character because you can't dance if you go from a bar of three into a bar of four and, and have a different, a different overall meter there, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But you can if you have a kind of triple and a duple interacting with each other just temporarily like that. So I, I, a, yeah, sorry, I think it's also uh, interesting in terms of the quartet dynamics, because just before that, you've heard the bit that I just played, where the first violin gets a bit flashy with this um, dance thing, and it's a little bit showing off, and then the, the viola and the cello, their interruption is certainly very rude, um, it's a little bit destabilizing, and in terms of the quartet dynamics, it's definitely like we heard enough of the first violinists, um, and I think then if you play the listesso tempo the second way, it's additionally disruptive. It's like they're really bossing things and taking us somewhere else. And, and so I very much like that interpretation. It's not how typically it's played, but I'm uh, very tempted to go back and do it next time. Do, do you, you don't, which way do you do it, Ed? We, we've tended to do it just keeping the quarter note the same, the way that you um, said, but I'm just looking at my music and in the place that you mentioned, Erica, where you like the bar to stay the same, which has the effect of it sort of, of the, of course, the quarter note being faster, so it feels faster. But then he writes Lissesso Tempo again, right afterwards, um, when the, the first part of the trio comes back. Somehow that makes a little bit more sense to me to reiterate that time after you've had this slightly crazy thing. So I, I really like that idea. I, I like it too for the idea of the first violin carrying you know, when you come back with that uh, tune again, so like you're picking up from where the cello and viola left off, it like makes that much more seamless as well. Mm -hmm. So like the whole thing just becomes like, you know, just a little episode rather than a complete uh, wrench away from mm -hmm. the universe. I like the, uh, your, your idea that also, and this is reflected, I think, in Ed, what you said about, uh, you know, just interactive, element of this that and I think this is something that Beethoven's late music does you know but particularly the late quartets there's a sense in which this is excerpting an entire sort of musical space like maybe even like a soundscape you know say are we in the ballroom and we hear something from outside there's something profoundly sort of almost Marlerian about that this sort of metropolitan space full of all of these different musics of which Beethoven is what is one you know mm -hmm. occupying this rather rarefied part of the musical firmament but you know fling the windows open and you hear things wafting in from the street things in ballrooms different you know social classes inevitably in a place as dense um you know dense yet hierarchical as Vienna and in a way we sort of hear all of these strata operating simultaneously. And I suppose the question is what you, you know, like as, as the question always is when you t talk about Mahler in relation to Vienna, you know, how do you entertain all of these different registers and voices and feels in the same space without it falling apart into 
so much bric-a-brac actually amounting to some particular aesthetic vision. I, I, yeah. I, I, like, I like that idea. I'm always, of course, thinking about the quartet dynamics and, and looking, imagining the type of tensions that there might have been between the first players who played this. And I think the cellist, Josef Linke, he would have liked this place very much and maybe particularly your version of it. Um, he'd been promised the first performance of the previous late quartet, Opus 127, and then Schuppensick, the first violinist, complained and said he'd already advertised it. And so Beethoven took it away from Linker and gave it to Schuppensick, 127. But instead, he gave Linker Opus 132, this one. So I think, uh, and it's, it's got a fantastic cello part throughout. And this is a nice moment of uh, cello and viola um, kind of revolution, if you like. And just on the first performers, we actually do have... Um a set of metronome marks, which we probably can't take too uh, literally, but they're from the original second violinist, Carl Holtz. And um, what he noted down for the Stesso Tempo was very explicit, that the bar re retains the same pulse. Mm -hmm. So as far as, you know, as far as we can take those marks um, as they are, it seems like that's the way the first group played it. And you know, perhaps that tells us that that's what uh, you know, maybe that's what happened before we entered the world of recordings and then everyone got used to hearing it one way and mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to un unhear that. Um, but, I've got uh, to imagine that during, during that first private performance of this piece, that this would have been one of the places that Beethoven would have jumped out of his chair and started waving his arms around and not being quite happy with how it was sounding. Or sometimes laughing. He was notorious for finding it hilarious if people got lost in, in scherzo <laughs> movements in a, yeah. in a first run through. Um, so maybe he got, you know, one over on the musicians and was <laughs> pleased with that. 